Amen. The family, last week we started a series on love titled The Most Excellent Way. Now, today we'll be doing the second part. And as we all know, Valentine is almost here. Exactly. And as usual, people are always under the pressure to impress and to be impressed. You know, I hope that's not the case for us, family. You know, as Miracle has helped us last week to see that we truly need love from above. God's love. Amen? Amen. Now, as usual, I have a question for you today. What is your take on fake products? Like, what's your opinion about it? Look at all of face is already looking like, what is that? What is your take on fake products? I, I need responses. If I can get responses. You know, they last. Okay. I think other people might have a different opinion on it. It might be that you have the opportunity to feel among. So why not go after it? You know, for me, I think, I think there are two types of fake products. You know, there's the fake original. It's very close. You know, it's very identical to the original. But if you pay careful attention to it, you can tell that it's fake. You know, example, Nike Air Force Ones. You see them everywhere. You know, those shoes, if you actually check the price on Nike store, it costs over $100. That's like 150 k or so. Yet, you will find them in boutique for 30 k 50 k You can even see it for 20 k if you know how to price well in Lagos Island. And when you wear it, you wear it with pride. Like, people will literally think that it's original. And if you step out with it, everybody thinks it looks nice. You know, you feel among. That's fake original. And then there is original fake. That one is very easy to recognize. Those ones are the Adadis. You know, the Puma that used to blow. If you blow like this, it'll be shaking. You know, when you even see the Nike, when you carry it, so it's Nike. It's not Nike. It'll be shaking anyhow. You just know that it is not original. You see it everywhere, you can get it easily. I think nowadays people are, you know, people are staying away from those products that are like fake, like original fake. You know, they stay around like fake original at least. You know, so it's not gonna fall your hand outside. So you can actually feel among, you can still feel like, okay, you're doing well in life, trying to fake it till you make it. You know, as we are in the month of love, and we are doing a series of love, the title of today's lesson is Fake Love. You know, it sounds like a Bible talk lesson. I've been trying to find a, another topic, another time, like, let's just go after it. Fake love. Turn your Bibles to Galatians chapter 1. Fake love. You know, this is a subject that stirs the hearts of people. You know, almost if not everyone has had a taste of it. Some have even eaten three course meal on fake love. You know, family, like I said, there's a saying, fake it till you make it. I even found a post on the internet yesterday titled, Reasons Why Fake Love Can Actually Lead to the Real Thing. So basically, some people believe that if you experience fake love for a right amount of time, it actually becomes real love. That's the kind of life we live in. In Galatians chapter 1, from verse 6, the Bible says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let there be other God's course. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's course. You know, family, here we find that even in the first century church, they already had issues with false doctrines and fake gospels. There were people that were preaching things that looked like the original gospel, but was no gospel at all. You know, if something so sacred as the gospel of Christ could have a fake version in its early stages, how much more love that people show today? And it was so serious that Paul, could play, Paul was like, I would place you under God's course. He knew the effect that a fake gospel could have on the church. I used to use, I used to, use to showing fake love or receiving fake love that you cannot even tell the difference anymore. What effect has fake love had on you? You know, the theme scripture for this love series is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And please turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'll read from verse 4. You know, Miracle did a great job last week breaking down the first two. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4, the Bible says, Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. 
it is not proud. So Merkel did a great job you know, explaining love is patient and love is kind, but I'll focus more on the other sides. Church, you know, from seeing what true love is, according to the scriptures, we can also figure out what fake love is all about. The Bible says love is patient. Definitely fake love cannot be patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Fake love will definitely envy. Fake love will definitely boast, and it will be proud. First point, fake love is insecure. Fake love is insecure. You know, Greek, the Greek word for envy here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is zelo. And it appears just once in the New Testament. And it means to be eager, to have like an intense desire for something or for someone. You know, it's a feeling of being dissatisfied or not being confident in your own position or in your current situation. You know, you have that belief that ah, this thing is not just good enough. You know, this other person has something better than I have. They have something better going, for, going on for them in their lives. You just want more and more. There's this intense desire in your heart. In fact, you know, people can actually mistake it for zeal. It is nothing close to zeal, and it's definitely nothing close to real love. You know, let's try something. Let's try an exercise. The first point is fake love is insecure. If fake love was replaced with your name, would this sound true? Like, Shego is insecure. Will your conscience say, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Would this sound true? The Bible makes it clear that love is neither jealous nor envious. But in case you need more proof, I don't know, I don't know I'm not sure the Bible is, is really right. Let's go deeper. In 1 John chapter 3, you know, this is a scripture we use like, we use like a supplementary scripture in the, first, in the discipleship study. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. Let's see what the standard was in the first century church. 1 John 3, verse 16, the Bible says, This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Amen. Amen. The question is, would you lay down your life for someone you are envious of? Think about it. Would you even try to lay down your life for someone that you are jealous of? In that moment, all you can think about is how you will get what they have. So basically, this person is about to be taken away or by a even if you don't say it out loud, deep down you ask, you're like, I find not this. I deserve this position. And the person is about to be taken out from that position, you're like, yes. Oh, no, you're like, sorry, sorry, you know, it's lost plan. And all. But deep down in your heart, you can never be happy that the person that can never be happy enough to even lay down your precious life for someone that you're envious of. How do you feel after comparing yourself to someone? Now, do you feel humbled or do you feel good about yourself? Do you feel like you're doing more better, you're doing better in life than the other person? You know, there's, there's a very funny example in Luke chapter 1. And I've been studying Luke for my quiet time. And I've been seeing interesting things, not just about Jesus, but about other people too. Luke chapter 1, from verse 39. In verse 39, the Bible says, At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's, Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord will fulfill his promises to her. Now here we see something very interesting. By the way, Mary, Elizabeth was Mary's aunt. Funny enough, I just found out when I was doing that. I literally thought they were sisters. But then the Bible said that Elizabeth was old when she had, when she conceived John the Baptist. But every other person says that they are sisters. I'm like, how we old woman be conceiving? And then Mary, the teenager, is conceiving her sisters. Amen. False doctrine. Mary, pregnant with Jesus, had visited her aunt. Elizabeth, who was also pregnant with John the Baptist in her old age. So Elizabeth, as well as her unborn child, they were overjoyed at the sound of Mary's greeting because she was carrying the Messiah, the Son of God. And mind you, Elizabeth was also carrying a miraculous baby because John the Baptist was actually conceived in her old age. Yet, she rejoiced with her niece. She was overjoyed. Does this describe you? You know, if you turn a bit further to um, chapter 3, Let's see another interesting story. 
Here we see that John the Baptist had started his ministry and he was bearing a lot of fruits. When in, in verse 15, the people were waiting expectantly and they were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, true, I am the Messiah. Okay, I wanted to test if everyone is following. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come. The straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hands to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But he will burn up the shaft with unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. Church, at this point, Jesus was yet to begin his ministry. Probably he was still doing carpentry with his father and all. John was already popular and he had made more success than Jesus. He was also a miraculous baby, like Jesus. Yet, he was only going to be a foreigner for Jesus. His role was to prepare the way for the Messiah. You know, John, as well as his mother, they understood that they played a different role in the grand scheme of things. Whether they came first before Jesus and Mary or not, they were not insecure. You know, they knew that God had a separate plan for their lives, and he had nothing to do with being a Messiah or being the Messiah's mother. The question for us is, are we content with where God has placed you at the moment? Or does your insecurity mask itself in being zealous for something better? Are you content with what, where God has placed you and what God has given you? You know, think about it. Imagine if your Bible talk was more fruitful than every other Bible talk in the church. But you were not choosing to, you're not choosing to do the special charge or to do a lesson or something. And you chose the other person that was not so doing well. It's Bible talk. What would your attitude be like? Would you start to compare? I start to think about your portfolio. Like, I, I, I did better than this brother. This, my Bible talk is going well. Why did he not choose me? Would you feel belittled? Or probably a younger disciple gets something that you have always wanted. Someone that just walked into, probably the person just got baptized in like three months. The person is already having every other thing that you have prayed for for three years. Would you still be secure in your relationship with God? Would you still be secure in your relationship with God's people? Church, real love rejoices when others are winning because that win does not discredit its hard work. Because you understand deep down that God will reward you according to all that you have done. You understand that your time will come. Amen? Amen. Amen. Family, let's turn to 2 Samuel chapter 13. Let's see another interesting story. Like I, say, like I said, Valentine is coming. And you will see a lot of intentional efforts to show love. You know, you might even start to get envious of the people that are getting so much love. I was in Unilag yesterday. And something that usually happens is that, you know, people will start posting that, hey, dispatch has arrived, though. Dispatch has arrived, though. Probably one lady will get like four different dispatch riders. And then the other people are like, oh, God, I beg. <laughs> Who did I offend? And you see the guys preparing, preparing like, yes, today is going to be special. You know, you might even start to think that these people, their love story is just obsession, to be honest, because you don't understand why it's going this, why it's going this way. But in 2 Samuel chapter 13, you see an interesting story. The story of Amnon and Tamar. And it's a story that is one to ponder about. In 2 Samuel chapter 13, verse 1, the Bible says, In the course of time, Amnon, son of David, fell in love with Tamar, the beautiful sister of Absalom, son of David. Amnon became so obsessed with his sister Tamar that he made himself ill. She was a virgin, and it seemed impossible for him to do anything to her. Now, Amnon had an advisor named Jonadab, son of Shimea, David's brother. Jonadab was a very shrewd man. He asked Amnon, why do you, the king's son, look so haggard, morning after morning? Won't you tell me? I'm not said to him, I'm in love with my sister, with Tamar, my brother, I'm Absalom's sister. Go to bed and prepare, pretend to be ill, Jonadab said. When your father comes to see you, say to him, I would like to see my sister Tamar to come and give me something to eat. Let her prepare the food in my sight so I may watch her and then eat it from her hand. This is a very interesting story. Drop down to verse 11. But when she took it to him to eat, he grabbed her and said, come to bed with me, my sister. No, my brother, she said to him, don't force me. Such a thing should not be done in Israel. Don't do this wicked thing. What about me? Where could I get rid of my disgrace? And what about you? You would be like one of the wicked fools in Israel. Please speak to the king. He will not keep me from being married to you. But he refused to listen to her 
And since he was stronger than she, he raped her. But the story didn't end there. Then Amnon hated her with intense hatred. In fact, he hated her more than he had loved her. Amnon said to her, get up and get out. You know, this is a very sad story. But the first thing to note is that Amnon overlooked the fact that Tamar was actually his sister. I mean, think about it. Of all things, the, the desire was so intense that you can literally overlook that this person is your sister. What kind of desires do you have? You know, later it looked like his love for his sister was actually real. It seemed like that, and he believed it. Only for his true intentions to be exposed, and he hated her more than he loved her. His fake love was marked by true intentions. In the church, how many good intentioned men and women are you toying with today? You know deep down in your heart that you're not supposed to be texting or responding to that person. Yet you go ahead because you desire something in return. You know, I feel like you're going to give me something. And then you're trying to, you know, find a way around it. Meet them but still remain a disciple. One leg in and one leg out. You don't think that God's standard of purity is good enough for you. You don't trust God's plans for your life. Family, our insecurity will only lead us to a dead end. Amen? Amen. Family, second point. Still on the topic, fake love. Second point. Fake love puts its ego first. Fake love puts its ego first. Good question. Do you put your ego first? You know, as we saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, love is not boastful. Love is not proud. It is as simple as it gets. It is neither puffed up nor does it brag. But then when someone puts their ego first, they cannot love themselves. They cannot love others or they cannot even allow themselves to be loved because all they can think about is themselves. In Matthew chapter 26, Man, are you still with me? In Matthew chapter 26. Let's see Jesus and his conversation with Peter and his disciples. Matthew 26, from verse 31, the Bible says, Then Jesus told them, This very night you will all fall away on account of me. I think if I heard that, I will be like, What? You know, in that moment, you start to rethink your life. I'll fall away? Like Jesus, I've literally been with you for three years. What do you mean I'll fall away? And then Jesus backs it up with scripture. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter, the one with the keys. Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. So first, Peter first shades every other person. Yes. Then he puffs himself up. And if every other person falls away, Jesus, I'm here for you. He proclaims his love to his Lord. I got you. I'm behind you, Jesus. I'm just wondering how other people will feel. They'll just be like, mm-hmm. <laughs> because you have been giving the keys to the kingdom now. And you are doing it anyhow. But then, Jesus did not stop there. Jesus said, truly, I tell you, verse 34, Jesus answered, this very night, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter, as he is, he declared again, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others were like, ah, at this point, what's wrong with this guy? And all the other disciples said the same, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. You know, the interesting thing is that this was Jesus speaking the truth. But Peter, he felt accused by Jesus, rather than thinking deeply before he responded. He could have just reminded himself that Jesus is God. Jesus cannot lie. Everything he has said so far has been true. This person can read your mind. He knows what you are saying. He has been telling the Pharisees what they are thinking in your heart. And he answers your question before they even say it. But you, of all people, have been with him for three years. He started to think that you are good enough for Jesus. Why, what did Peter do instead? He put his ego first. You know, it just felt like his love for Jesus was too real to be questioned by Jesus. You know, are you like this? When you are challenged by the truth, you feel, start to feel accused. Do you sit down and reconsider? You know, this is an area I've struggled with. You know, especially when I feel like I'm growing in a particular aspect of my life. 
and someone comes and points out faults or suggests that yeah, you have not really grown here. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> it's like, are you God? And do you, did you see me in those moments that I was growing? Are you always around me? And you start to reconsider that this person questioning my efforts in growing. Or when corrections are made in places that I just feel like it's just perfect and the person is still making corrections. Like, it can just be a struggle. What is it for you? You know, is it unsolicited advice? You know, especially when it comes from someone that you feel like does not know anything in that area. You're just struggling in your heart. I mean, the designers in the house can relate. We have finished designing. Somebody that is not a designer will just come. And I think you need to put, put, just put blue here, put red here. <laughs> Go and design your own now. <laughs> you put, sometimes you just want to be, you want to act on, but you're like, oh, thank you so much, bro. I appreciate your efforts. Thank you, bro. In that moment, you're like, please, just continue what you're doing, please. It can be a struggle. Do you put your ego first? Or do you see the love in the feedback and in the corrections? You know, you know what is as funny about this passage? Jesus said, it is written. Yet, Peter still wanted to defend himself. Jesus did not even see the need to start to prove. Jesus just showed him scripture. It is written. When you are shown the scriptures in your D times, by random brother or sister, do you still see the need to defend yourself? Even Satan, the ogre pata pata of sinners, when Jesus told him, it is written, he changed the topic. But Satan understood that God's word must be true. Baba changed the topic. But then Peter, on the other end, felt like he needed to defend himself. When your leader offers you advice or direction, do you allow your ego to cloud your decisions? If you find it hard to take advice or help from a leader, how much more someone that you feel like you are on the same level with? Or how much more someone that you feel like you are leading or you should be leading? Do you think you'd be willing to take advice from them? In John chapter 5, Amen, family. John chapter 5. I'll read from verse 1. The Bible says, Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem near the sheep gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie. The blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, yes, I want to get well. But think about it. This sounds like, you know, when, when you are hungry and then you clearly don't have any means to get any food. Though. Fortunately, somebody offers to help. Do you want to eat? That's when I start beating around the bush. And yeah. um, the thing is that, you know, I've been very busy, so I've not been able to go out to buy food. You know, I did not bring my ATM. Yeah, I don't have change. I've not withdrawn. My bank app is not working, so I cannot transfer. I forgot my card at home, and so on and so forth. Or you'll be in a situation where you feel like you have put in so much effort into something, and you feel like it's already good enough, and somebody just walk by and say, there's a better way to do this. How would you feel? That feeling right there, that's your ego. Maybe it's about salvation. Think about it. Funny how I met a guy, I think it was last week. He didn't want to study the Bible. He didn't want to study the Bible with me because he felt like he didn't want to be confused. He heard me study the Bible with someone else. And I was questioning, and the Bible was really questioning his conviction on being saved. And the other guy, I looked at him, do you want to study the Bible? I was like, hey, bro, bro, I'll be, I like what I know. Please, I don't want to be confused. He feared that he might actually not be saved according to the scriptures. Wouldn't it be better to just do what is right now? For him, he felt like he was confident enough to go and meet God and tell God what he thinks he knows. When the Bible literally shows it clearly and he could just have accepted the truth. He ran away because of fear of being wrong. You know, for our guests visiting today, have you ever thought that you might actually not be saved according to the scriptures? Think about it. Think deeply about it. Have you ever even considered that you might actually not be saved according to the scriptures. What if you found out from the Bible that you're not saved? How would you respond? Would you think that, eh, all way in a way, you know, Jesus is the Lord of all. Any way to Jesus will walk. And when we reach heaven, we find out. Would you put your ego first? 
It sounds funny, but it's really serious. Yeah. This is a matter of salvation. You know, I challenge you to study the Bible today. Come on, bro. Study the Bible with the person that invited you. Do not leave church today without studying the Bible. Don't let your ego get, stop you from getting right with God. Amen? Amen. In verse 8, then Jesus said to him, in verse 7, Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is dead. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. At once the man was cured, he picked up his mat and walked. You know, the fun thing is that Jesus asked the man if he wanted to get well. The man probably felt like Jesus was questioning all the effort he has made all the 38 years to get well. So he saw the need to defend himself. He almost pushed Jesus away. The only chance he had at getting well. But do you notice how Jesus helped him regardless? Jesus helped him regardless because he understood that this man felt pain. He understood the man's pain. Are you willing to help people regardless? You know, when people put their ego first in Bible studies, when people put their ego first in D times, are you willing to help regardless? Are you willing to respond with love? That's how you will help them. Your ego will not do anything. You trying to prove that you know better will not do anything. You just keep clashing and you're wondering, where's the problem? You're not fruitful. Oh, this brother is not growing. Our relationship is not this, it's not that. Have you tried to be humble? You know, your humility would actually help another person to be humble. You know, funny enough, like a hurting dog will bite you when you are trying to help it. Even a fowl that just laid eggs would also try to harm you, hurt you when you are trying to help it. That's how people are when they are hurting. All they need is the love. Amen? Amen. If you're patient enough to allow them to see your intentions, they will trust you. In your family, when we see ego, let us respond with love. Because you should put the well-being of other people above your pride. Amen? Amen. In your family, let's close out with Romans chapter 12. In Romans chapter 12, we see what love is. Romans chapter 12 and verse 9. The Bible says, Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. And the church says, Amen. Church, there are a lot of people today out there showing intentional efforts that look like love. You know, there are guys hoping to take advantage of ladies just to go and brag about it in their rooms. Brag about it with their friends. Feel like they are Mr. Macho. They are on top of the world. Life is going well for them. And there are ladies taking advantage of men just to feel good about themselves and have something to gist about. It looks like love, but it is not love. You know, there are so many quotes for what love is and what love should look like or what love should be. But so many people don't talk about what love shouldn't be. And this is the reason why people keep falling victim of, of giving to and accepting fake love. In your family, there is good news. What is the good news? The Bible makes it clear what true love is. Go back to the Bible. Like I said, if you're a guest, study the Bible with us. And if you're a disciple, you would never experience good true love until you start to put it into practice and to God be all the glory. Amen.